in a fast growing social media world, deciphering between the true, the authentic, and the honest individuals creating real disruptive changes in their industry has become very difficult. Many people are quick to flash the cards, the money, but very slow to give people the true wisdom they seek. This is why we started the Real Estate Disruptors. To bring you in front of real disruptors, changing not only the barriers in their industries, but doing it and impacting millions of lives. Welcome to the Disruptor Network. Our next disruptor, a true New York City legend, from starting his first business at 17 to representing and employing thousands through his businesses and organizations. He is now the first Hispanic immigrant to ever run for New York City mayor. This is Fernando Mateo. My parents immigrated to the United States in 1950. My older sister was born here and my parents decided uh, the last child, which was me, I should be born in the Dominican Republic, and that's where I was born. Came here when I was two and a half years old. When I was 14 years old, I was forced to go into public school for the first time in my life. And public school, I found out everything about what wasn't good about New York City. Uh, drugs, crime. You went to school for everything but to learn. And I decided that wasn't the life I really wanted. And what I did was drop out of school. I went to trade school and I learned how to lay floors. At 14 years old, I got a job. That was the foundation that made me, was being able to have an opportunity as a kid to realize that there was a lot more than my community, than the place that I lived in, than the ghetto that I lived in and I was able to pull myself up by my shoestrings and continue the path that they taught me, the path of success. I would love to see that for every New York City kid. I think every child in New York should have the opportunity to work part-time after school. Instead of hanging out in their hood, they can learn what I learned. As mayor, I would make sure that I engage corporate America, that I engage small businesses, that I engage community businesses to employ kids from their community so that they can learn what I learned. Coming together uh, is gonna bring a lot of results in reducing crime and being able to uh, make safer streets and safer neighborhoods uh, in the inner cities. Well, at 17 years old, I got married. And ironically, I opened up my first carpet store and I rented the space. My father signed the lease because I was 17 years old, I was a minor. And I had nothing in terms of money, but I had myself. I knew that I could do anything that I wanted to do in life. I was my only obstacle. I didn't want anyone to tell me when to get up, what time to go to sleep, what kind of car I could drive, where I should live. When you're employed by someone, that's your life because you can only spend as much as you make. I wanted to be the person who, who determined how much I was worth and that's what made me successful. Of course, I had my little experiences. I immediately hired two guys to, to do the installations, and I was the boss, and you know, I had a store, and I had a desk, and I was, I was the boss. But after the first week, I didn't make enough money to pay them. So I learned a hard lesson, and that was, you can't sit in here, people aren't gonna come to you, you gotta go out and and find them. I used to leave my home at four in the morning. I used to throw cards on the doors in every housing project around the city. And then people would call me. And I had this big empty store. 
I had no inventory, I had nothing. But I had a lot of samples. And I had a great gift, which was the gift of selling. And after I closed the store at six at night, I'd go out and do my measurements and give estimates and get deposits to those that wanted to give me a deposit and do the job without a deposit if I thought they were gonna pay me but didn't trust me because I was a kid. So it was, it was pretty tricky but I found the loopholes and one thing that I had was a lot of energy. And I became very successful after that. So the store grew and grew and grew and I built it to be, Carpet Fashions became the largest minority owned floor covering company in America. We were doing $15 million when I sold the company back in the early 90s. You know, I remember people used to chase me out of buildings thinking I was, I was trying to break in because imagine someone's opening the door while you're trying to throw a card under their door and they see you there they say, what are you doing? They say, I'm just throwing a card, get out of here. And they used to chase me out of the buildings, but my store was open seven days a week because that's all I had. My business became my life. It's what I dreamt, it's what I slept, it's what I... Remember, I depended on myself in order to pay my rent, support my family. I had a child, and they all depended on me. So I had to make it work. There was no turning back. There was no going back to becoming an employee. You know, I was tired of doing the same thing, and then I expanded into other businesses. You know, I started a money wiring business, started a construction company. It all evolved into restaurants and, and clubs and the nightlife, and I'm a stockbroker. I own a securities firm on Wall Street. I'm a principal, meaning I have my Series 7, my 63, and my 24. So there's a lot of things that I've done in a lot of different industries that I own. You know, in, in 89, I went to Rikers Island and I started a training program to teach first-time nonviolent offenders a skill. Like I learned the skill. And when they would come out, I'd get them a job. And that stopped recidivism. Basically, I taught the city a lesson. And that is if you create opportunity for the young, they won't be in jail. Then I did Toys for Guns, and that was in 93. I got more guns off the city streets than anyone in history. I was able to get thousands of guns off the city streets in weeks, trading toys for guns. I was one of the most influential people in America. There were five of us. Bill Clinton, who had just won the White House. Madonna, who won the Grammys. Jimmy Johnson, Pat Riley, who had won the NBA championship, and Fernando Mateo. Can you imagine that? This was on the front pages of the New York Times. Keeping drivers safe, that's the goal of a pilot program kicking off today, outfitting a dozen livery cab drivers with bulletproof vests. We're going to reach out to NYPD, to individual police officers, uh, and ask them that at the time they decide to retire, we would really appreciate if they can make uh, a donation of their bulletproof vest to the Federation as well. In 99, they were killing 60 cab drivers a year, and they had no hope of turning that around. You know, and they came to me and asked me for help, and I, we formed the New York State Federation of Taxi Drivers, which I'm their spokesman today, but I'm also the founder. And we stopped those murders and those assaults by bringing together the government, the mayor, the governor, and the police commissioner. And we fought tooth and nail, back and forth. I got $5 million out of the city to protect the drivers. They were being slaughtered and no one acknowledged that. That was unacceptable. Today, it's a much safer industry because of the work that we did to make it that what it is. And I did the same with the bodegueros. You know, bodegueros are sitting ducks. You walk in there with a gun, you shoot them, you walk out with their cash and nobody realizes it until someone comes in and finds the body. So we worked to change that. We got cameras, we got lighting, we got, you know, panic buttons. We got all kinds of things available for them today. And that's what I do, I create change. If you can make it in New York, you can make it anywhere. This is a tough city to, to succeed. The easiest thing for me to do would be to move out, go to another state, 
where taxes aren't so high, where crime isn't so rampant, where the government helps and protects small businesses. That's the easiest thing to do. I can do that anytime. But I love New York. New York made me who I am. New York allowed me to be the person that I am. I've roughed it out. I've worked very hard. And you know what? I'm running for mayor because I want to bring my experience to every New Yorker. I want everyone to have the same opportunities that I had. This is a city of immigrants. Immigrants come here to work hard, to build businesses like I did, like my parents did, right? So we need to have a mayor that represents them too. This city has become very black and white and they've forgotten everyone in between. We need to unite everyone. So, so we're, we're, look, we're looking at Airbnb places, but like more like Airbnb places that may be a little bit off the, the off the radar that the, 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 the areas aren't flooded in it. So when you look, we look to places that are either vacation or experience places. I, I'm really focused on experience spaces. And when we look up the data on it, the properties are Airbnb for a decent amount of money. Like, Uko, what would you say that they're getting per night there? Uh, a two bedroom, two bath is getting like 250. So ours is, you'll see it as a four bedroom. So we're, we'll get upwards of 350 a night. Mm -hmm. And, and if you look at the purchase price on something like this with the taxes, our mortgage payment on this is going to be somewhere between thirteen and $1,400. Yeah. So, you know, you do the math, even if we only rent it half, half of the time, right? If we like, yeah, you're up to grand. You're up a lot of money. So, you know, just Airbnb is a lot more work. And I, I don't want anybody to get the idea that it's not. It's more work than a normal rental is because it's, it's constant questions. It's constant um, people needing things. It's, it's problems. Like we spoke about before in Jersey City, we had a problem last week with a bad tenant. Um, but it's your return on investment is much higher. Yeah. So that you know that that becomes the reason to do it is that, it, like anything else, it, if you're going to make more money on it, it's going to be more work. So you know this is I just I, we're lucky because we have a decent sized team at this point now that's grown in the last six months. We went from just being me and David to like now being this five this five of us yeah. about to be six. What probably what do you think we're putting this year? Like thirty or forty thousand? Yeah, about thirty. 30 and uh, another 10. Right? So this is going to be a, a, one of our bigger projects to date. Um, even though it doesn't sound like a big dollar amount, it's just because of where it is and what's got to be done. Um, and it's both interior and exterior. But it's nice. We, we actually, we paid 175 for it and it appraised for 215, which in this market is kind of unheard of. Yeah. We got lucky almost in a little bit. I mean, I, I want to say that I, I thought we bought really good, but we did buy good, but it's something with some luck involved in it. What's that? That's just a no, but this has to end here. This has to end here, and we need to get rid of all this, because then it opens up this kitchen. This house, you know, hopefully we come back in a few months and this will, this will look a lot different than it looks right now. Um, it has a ton of potential. So I'm, I'm really actually excited about this property more than you would think, but it, it's, it's some work. Like I thought, I personally probably won't be back here for a month. <laughs> They'll start working a couple of weeks and I'll be back here in a month to start to see the beginning of it. But, uh, you know, this is, this is how you get properties cheap sometimes. You got to do a lot of work, especially in New Jersey where the market is. So. Um, I'm excited though. I'll be more excited when we bring you back in a few months and it looks a lot different. This <laughs> stuff is a little hidden gem that we found. So for the outdoor experience, so you see it's got the whole backyard is all trees, so you have the whole nature experience. Mm. So we want to set up like, you have a cabin, like you're living inside it, but also like an outdoor experience. So you have a huge deck, you have the barbecue, we want to set up some, cool, some cool fire pits, hammocks up there. So mm. it's like, and then you have the whole view of the lake. This will probably cost us between fifteen and twenty thousand dollars in repairs, and the, that's the whole thing too. Is learning in real estate is that getting in, 
even when you walk through property like it means nothing, we figured out that that's still fifteen dollars or twenty thousand dollars <laughs> between appliances and paint and every like railings. Different. Yeah, every house is different, but even nothing is. So if you think it needs forty, it probably needs eighty. I look at things different. I don't really look at things. I look at cap rates, but I'm really more looking to make a percentage on my money. I'm always looking to make between 12 and 15 percent on my money. So this property cost us like 210 to get into, between repairs, down payment, closing costs, and everything. That's cost about 210,000. So to make 10 percent out of money, we had we had we have to make 21,000 this year on the property. The windows, the trimming, everything gets painted. The lights over here, we're going to change. It was like five and a half years. We'll have our initial investment back. So then, you, then you're, you're free, right? You're completely free, and then you, the interest is just accruing over time. So in my opinion, the only way to, it's really hard to flip properties, especially in the Northeast at this point. Now, I don't think the margins are there anymore. You know, to make $30,000, $40,000 on a property put six months into it doesn't make a lot of sense to me for the price point, for the risk. But for this, as a, over a long term, at a 15% multiple, your money's multiplying. In 10 years, you're, you're, really, you're, you're, you're really cashing a lot. And there's also outs in all this process. We can cash out, refinance, use that money to buy another property. We can sell if the value goes up enough, use that to buy more properties. But this is a long-term hold because it just it, it's such a, a, a good revenue driver for rentals. That's what it looked like before. Walk me through that that like that moment when you realize that you're about to buy a property that's the same cost as what you bought up here up north. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. what is it where that you go? I know I'm down south and it's supposed to be cheaper, but this investment is actually going to make me more money and it's actually worth it. I'm really focusing on areas like you know what we, what, I, what I'm really doing in the process beforehand is looking at areas that are on the uptick because there's some kind there's some reason for it right so florida in general is a ton of people moving there after the before the pandemic and after the pandemic but mostly now because now tax laws have gone up every single where the tax rates going up every single where and florida is there's no state income tax so people besides the weather besides covid besides everything else are moving down there in droves right now so all right what are the areas i can focus on in florida that make a lot of sense so the first place we, we bought was ocala we bought two properties next door to each other in ocala because it's a transitioning area it's not a super expensive area but there's a lot of there's a ton of money coming to the area and a ton of a ton of um new visitors and, and people coming there to check the area out or stay there short term so we bought two properties there a lot cheaper um, which they were 320 and 325 um, and both properties sleep between 8 and 12 people um, and, and the same thing with there they're gonna get between 300 and 400 dollars a night um, taxes are very very low there so those areas made sense and what and, and, and yeah and World Equestrian Center so you know they, they just built World Equestrian Center which is they spent five billion dollars on and it just opened and it's got a big horse community um, that it's going there and, and those people have money you know and people who spend three thousand dollars a month to board their horses have a lot of money to rent houses so that was another reason to be down there. Um, and again, every single place I'm buying, and I can tell you this, whether it's in New Jersey or it's in Dominican Republic with David or it's in Florida, I have somebody who's giving me insight there that I wouldn't be able to get, get other ways, like Ocala. My, my cousin who's from up here now lives down there because he's in the horse business. And he told me, you gotta come check out the store downtown, it's exploding. So I had an inside person that lives there, I voiced, I'm not pulling the, the data out of the air. And then the remodeling cost for here, we spent 45. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And what are you looking at when it comes to a cap rate on an investment? This one's going to be about 22%. Yeah, this is, this is a home run. Oh, wow. A lighter color, yeah. This is a, a, lighter, a lighter wood color? No, like white. Why white though? Because it's going to make it look bigger. And stops. it's so much wood that it looks cramped. So yeah. we'll leave natural wood. If I could really rent it, then it makes a lot more sense. You said the ties are around, what, 32? I would, yeah. 3, this, 4, this is 36, yeah. so it, yeah. it works out. People's habits have changed. And, and because of what's going on with COVID and the pandemic and everything else, people will, will be traveling to Europe and stuff a lot less over the next few years. So, you know, we have a small window at the very least to, to make this work and then, and then figure out what the long term. But again, if every single one of these properties, for my purposes, is dried up right now and I couldn't Airbnb any, any of them, we would still be okay. Like, you know, I, I think you have to look at things like that also. Like, if my strategy is Airbnb and 
there is no Airbnb, then am I out of business? Or do I have to close my doors? So, you know, the way we look at things is that if we had to rent this property just to rent it, would it work? Yeah, yes, it does. It still works. It, the return isn't as high, but there's still a return. I always have, have preached about HGTV, like people think they watch HGTV and, and it shows you how to buy a house. It, it, it's not that easy, you know what I mean? And the problem with those areas is that you don't really ever, you, you hardly know where they're shopping. They're not telling you the real particulars of the process. Like you need somebody who's gonna tell you like in this market where everything's uh, overbid and all this, what are the tips to buy now? Like how do you buy today? Like because real estate changes so quickly, like how are you buying today? Not in general, rallies, like how do I bought over the last 10 years? Like how do I buy today? So I think more than anything, that's been a learning experience for me again this year, which is like, well, how do I buy in this market? And how do I buy in areas that are actually appreciating and aren't, God forbid there's some kind of correction and there's some depreciation in values again, um, how am I protected?